Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello, and welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's podcast. My name is Kayla Kleiss, and I'm Assistant Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project here at the Federalist Society. Today, we're delighted to host Jeff Steer for discussion on the Reagan Udall Foundation's December 22, 2022 reports on the FDA's tobacco and human foods programs, what the reports mean, and what happens next. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's program, as the Federalist Society takes no position on any particular legal or public policy issues. Mr. Steer, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Kayla. Good to be with you all. Uh, for our audience, a brief introduction. Mr. Steer is a senior fellow at the Consumer Choice Center. He's also a senior fellow at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance and a policy advisor to the Heartland Institute. He is widely quoted in media and has written health policy op-eds for the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, the New York Post, Washington Examiner, Fox News, and National Review Online has been interviewed by several other news sites. Additionally, uh, Mr. Steer has testified before state and local legislatures throughout the U.S. at FDA scientific hearings and the Office of Management and Budget and at hearings for the United Nations and Israel's Knesset. Set. Now, while there's more to say, in the interest of time, I'll cut my introduction there, but if you'd like to know more, you're welcome to visit regproject.org and read Mr. Steer's impressive and full bio. With that, however, we'll turn to our discussion. Uh, let's start at the beginning. What is the Reagan Udall Foundation? So the Reagan Udall Foundation was set up by Congress uh, to support uh, and assist the FDA in its work. So um, it's kind of an independent group, but it's also uh, has ex officio uh, FDA commissioners on its board. Uh, so in, in one sense, it's independent and external, but it was also set up by Congress, uh, is largely funded by the FDA as well as other grants, uh, but it's there to help FDA do a better job in its work. So it's not the FDA, it's external. Um, it's independent and outside of the FDA, but its mission is to support the FDA and uh, make the FDA better in its work. Okay, so it, it's connected to, but it's external, and it regularly issues reports for the FDA, if I understand correctly. Um, and we're particularly talking about two reports that it issued recently, the first of which uh, was issued on December 6, 2022, and touched on the operational evaluation of the FDA Human Foods Program. What was this report? What prompted it? And why is it important? Well, uh, this report, it was kind of two reports in one. It was an umbrella of the FDA asking the foundation to do a review of its operational practices in two specific areas. One was food and one was tobacco. Uh, and while the FDA often goes to the Reagan Udall Foundation to uh, give it some outside expertise, it's usually much uh, narrower, uh, very specific uh, narrower questions. Here, while the questions it asked uh, Reagan Udall Foundation to review were uh, certainly narrowly tailored, uh, they were big questions uh, in terms of how, how is the FDA organized, how does it do its work, specifically in those two categories, and then even within those two categories, um, narrowly defined. So, for instance, on tobacco policy or tobacco regulation, uh, where the uh, Center for Tobacco Products Division at the FDA uh, Commissioner Califf asked for a review of their operations and their communications, their regulatory review process, but they did not ask for a review of the FDA's policy decisions. Uh, and that, that kind of narrowed the scope, although as we're discussed, as, although as we will discuss uh, during this conversation, uh, personnel is policy, uh, object, uh, operational activity is policy, uh, and you can't really separate them out. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, limit um, actually played out in the real world in terms of the Reagan Udall uh, review on tobacco policy. Okay, so there were two aspects to this report. The first came out on December 6th, and the second came out on December 19th, just a few days ago as we're recording this. Um, what were the two sort of reports? How do they differ? Um, and what are what is important to know as treating them as distinct units? Well, on, um, on the food side, uh, it was really no surprise uh, that the FDA needs some help in terms of reorganizing. Uh, there are a number of different uh, divisions within the FDA. Um, if you just imagine how it's organized, it's not as if there's a chain of command where there, here's the uh, food division and here's the commissioner. There are many different food divisions. 
and they kind of all report to different places. Uh, so without a chain of command, you could imagine um, there are turf battles, uh, and uh, the problems at FDA and food really came to uh, came to light or became even more obvious and of national interest over the last year when there was this huge ba uh, infant formula shortage um, and and how the FDA engaged in terms of the Abbott plant that produced most of our infant formula in this country and how it had to shut it down because of possible contamination and then uh, the shortage uh, that that exacerbated. Um, it really uh, shined a spotlight on the FDA's food regulatory area and um, very glaring was the lack of, uh, or, of good organizational consistency. And so that, that was really no surprise to anybody. Uh, but one of the things that a lot of experts, myself included, expected uh, when you've got the FDA going to an outside, semi-outside independent group saying, critique our work, um, those of us with a healthy skepticism uh, for government power uh, predicted uh, that the FDA was hoping that this outside external group would come up with two important recommendations. Number one, the FDA needs more power, needs more authority. And number two, in order to enforce that power, it needs more taxpayer dollars. So that's what the skeptics, myself included, uh, were wary of. And I wrote about it in the Washington Examiner when the, when the report first uh, was, when this uh, expert report was first commissioned. Um, thought it was strange for it to be called an independent expert report when, in fact, the people running the report were not only paid by the FDA to do the report, but were made up of former FDA commissioners on the board, as well as, uh, for instance, the tobacco report was, was headed up, the panel was headed up by the former chief of staff at the FDA. And things move kind of slowly. So if you're looking back at what happened over the past few years, you're basically reviewing your own work and how critical are they able to be. And um, that's why I think uh, they stressed that it was an outside independent report. Uh, I think many people scoffed at that idea. But to kind of inoculate the foundation's work from that criticism, it based its report on outside experts, outside of the own of their own panel, they went to outside experts to get input. What are their observations, and how did they see the the FDA working? Uh, and I think that's um, that was how they were able to say, okay, this was independent because we're basing our recommendation on the observations of these outside experts. So you touched on this a little bit. Well, what was the process Reagan et al. followed in order to produce these reports? They've got expert experts. They've got a variety of inputs. Um, who was at the table and what were the sort of ideas that were being shared? So uh, the report was uh, headed up, the foundation's work, uh, by a panel of experts. Uh, they were on the tobacco side, there were five uh, similar uh, on the food side. A and they were kind of a, on a fact-finding mission. And they announced we're going to go to stakeholders inside government. Uh, so there were former or current FDA staffers who were able to testify anonymously. Uh, and there were uh, stakeholders. So that included um, industries, industry stakeholders. It included uh, uh, public health organizations. It really went uh, kind of broadly. And while the panel was made up of of some former FDA officials, it also included specialists in uh, organization. How do we organize these agencies? So it's not a, it was subject matter experts, but also broader than that um, to help bring together, uh, you know, the, the comments or the recommendations and observations were driven by the comments from stakeholders, uh, but they were informed with the various expertise of the panel members who have been there before at the FDA or are actually subject matter experts in organization. Uh, so it was able to kind of weave all that together into the final report, uh, which came out a few weeks ago and again uh, this week while we're recording on the tobacco side. And you were able to be one of the external experts consulted on that tobacco report, yes? How was that experience? I was. It was, um, it was interesting. Coming from an outside group, it had a feel. I've testified at many FDA meetings. It had that same feel uh, where it was very controlled. Uh, we're limiting the scope of your testimony to these areas. Um, but it was, um, it was a very open process in terms of giving uh, the experts an opportunity to have their voices heard across a, a wide range of policy views. So it was really great to hear uh, 
public health groups, uh, policy groups, uh, stakeholders in, in industry, even um, users of these products uh, were able to testify. And I found that the panel was very open and interested, very engaged with the experts, and they asked probing questions. So we had an opportunity maybe uh, seven minutes to testify, uh, and they would group a few experts together. And then at the end of that panel of experts, the floor would open up to the Reagan Udall Foundation members to ask the experts questions and really hone down on what they were interested in. I thought the process went very well, but it made me wonder at the time, those were really scathing comments about the FDA's work. Uh, and given my healthy skepticism, uh, I'm wondering whether the final report would accurately and transparently reflect uh, those that really powerful, uh, broad-based criticism uh, that the Center for Tobacco Products received from the experts. Uh, there's that skepticism that maybe it'll be a whitewash. Maybe they'll say, oh, they did all these things wrong. If only they had more money and more authority. Uh, and of course, uh, that was part of the recommendation. Uh, it, did, it did recommend, for instance, user fees uh, for, for products like e-cigarettes. But uh, if you think about how that works, how user fees work. A lot of the FDA is funded by user fees on the pharmaceutical side. And those user fees have to be reauthorized by Congress every period of time. And by having user fees that have to be reauthorized by Congress, it gives Congress the ability to exercise more oversight. So it's not as if the, what happened here was that the Congress said, FDA, you have authority to regulate tobacco products and it set out how it must be done. And then Congress walks away and the FDA does its job. When you have user fees that have to be reauthorized by Congress, it's really an important and useful uh, separation of powers oversight opportunity for Congress to be engaged in the oversight of the agency on an ongoing basis. So it's not as if uh, Congress creates the agency and then walks away. It, it uh, improves, I think, uh, intergovernmental in engagement on these issues. And that's given the, the outcome of the report and the observations from the experts uh, that's going to be really important as we go into 2023. Uh, I think a Republican House uh, is going to be very eager to look at what these recommendations were. Um, some of those recommendations will have to be implemented at the administrative level. Some of them will require, I think, new rulemakings. Um, some of it could be done just by the commissioner. Some of it will have to be new rulemakings. And some of it will require congressional authorization. Uh, some of it may require the administration, say the White House, to uh, set, the, set the agency on a better path. So there's a lot going on in terms of how do those recommendations get implemented, if at all. So it's really interesting from a separation of powers from an administrative law perspective. Okay, well, before we move on to sort of what the reports mean uh, in the future and, and implementing them, uh, briefly on the conclusions that the, the reports drew, you mentioned you were surprised in many ways. Uh, you thought, okay, maybe it will be more people, more money. And it doesn't seem that that was the only answer uh, that, that was provided. Uh, how, what were conclusions were drawn and did they address some of the concerns raised during these sort of open um, discussions with outside experts? Yes, um, to the Reagan Udall Foundation's uh, credit, the report itself was in fact very transparent. It was based on, I would say, a very balanced uh, group of perspectives from public health organizations who uh, testified that uh, enforcement of the law of the regulations has been poor. So that means uh, e-cigarettes that uh, should not be in the marketplace are in the marketplace and the FDA hasn't done enough to enforce it. And the Reagan Udall Foundation incorporated those public health concerns into its report and suggested that the FDA, which is a regulatory agency, first and foremost, exercising under statutory authority, um, needs to work with other governmental agencies that have enforcement uh, experience uh, and uh, and and you know, for instance, uh, there is a division, uh, ATF, 
And people often forget that the T stands for, for tobacco. There's a lot of work on alcohol. There's a lot of work on firearms. Um, and maybe the uh, ATF ought to be uh, more involved. Maybe the FDA needs to do a better job working with state and local governments uh, to provide enforcement at the local level, which is where kids are buying illegal e-cigarettes. Uh, the FDA doesn't have the police force to do it all on its own. So... I think it's important from a policy perspective that those public health groups uh, be listened to. And industry shared the same view. Industry, who has spent a lot of money on the regulatory process for those companies that did get authorization, uh, they ought to be protected by that authorization and have that market. Uh, and now they're competing against an illegal market. So I think there was a broad consensus from the diverse experts that there needs to be better enforcement, whether that's ATF, whether that's other uh, government agencies at the federal level, as well as state and local, uh, the FDA needs to do a better job. And even those who uh, want there to be a broad availability of lower risk nicotine products like e-cigarettes available to adult smokers to help them quit smoking and improve their health, even those people want better enforcement of, of, uh, of these rules. Because right now the FDA, and this was one of the reactions of the report, in fact, in the overview, that the foundation concluded that the Center for Tobacco Products has been reactionary rather than proactive in its regulatory role. And it's been on its back foot. And there hasn't been a strategy, a broad you know, policy strategy going forward about how the FDA ought to use its authority. So I think um, those types of recommendations um, really reflect the broad perspective uh, of many of the experts. One of the things that I testified about was the law, Congress gave FDA authority uh, to regulate and authorize lower risk products to improve public health uh, and kind of balance the risk of younger people uh, using these products and initiating nicotine use uh, versus the benefits of these products to adult smokers and helping them quit. Uh, and the report was pretty clear that the FDA needs to do a better job of being transparent in the regulatory process so that the regulated companies know what to expect when they put in a product in uh, for authorization. Right now, the way it's been working is there's this general standard appropriate for the protection of public health. So if a product that the FDA is reviewing is appropriate for the public health, it shall receive authorization to be marketed. And if the FDA concludes that a product is not uh, appropriate for the protection of public health. That's a pretty high standard uh, that these products have to improve public health on a whole. Um, then if, it, if it's not appropriate for the protection, that product shall not be authorized. Well, the FDA in its years long uh, regulatory process developed rules for applications and nowhere, even, even though industry requested it, nowhere did the FDA say, in order to show that your product is appropriate for the public health, we need the following types of studies. We need the following types of data. It, it, here's what you need to meet that burden. And the FDA ignored those requests and just kept it very general. And then what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, products that companies spent millions of dollars to put applications in for are being denied, receiving marketing denial orders, and they don't even know why. And as we saw with Juul, uh, some of those products, uh, uh, some of those marketing denial orders were later withdrawn because the FDA said that it didn't get the science right. And there were unique scientific issues with Juul that needed to be reevaluated. And it, with, it kind of backtracked under, uh, under the threat of litigation. Uh, so I think all of the, the messy situation that the FDA got itself into, and in fact, the report said that many of the problems, for instance, everything they're doing is mired in litigation, were largely self-inflicted because of a lot of that litigation is about the fact that companies didn't know what to submit, and now they're saying that the FDA was arbitrary and capricious in its implementation of the regulations. Well, if FDA had only put out clear product standards, here's what you need to show, a lot of that litigation uh, would have gone away by now. You know, you could always say, well, the tobacco industry, the e-cigarettes, they're going to sue. That may be true. 
But uh, as we just saw with the Supreme Court denying a Reynolds uh, tobacco company uh, effort to overturn a new flavor ban in the state of California, those get dismissed very quickly when there aren't many merits. Whereas a lot of the e-cigarette litigation is still in court because it actually did have merit. And in those cases, which are going to, you know, they're not going to be a review of FDA's approach, but they're going to be on the merits of each individual product and each individual lawsuit are starting to come together. Uh, And I think in those cases, some of the strongest evidence that will be provided is this Reagan Udall Foundation report, an external review requested by the FDA itself coming from former FDA officials interviewing a broad spectrum of experts comes to a conclusion that says the problems are self-inflicted because the FDA wasn't clearly communicating what its expectations were from the regulated industry as the law required. So this report will not only impact the FDA's work and and the FDA has issued a statement that it's going to take the next few weeks uh, to consider this 30 something odd page report, Um, but it's also going to impact uh, cases that are currently Uh, being litigated on a a specific product by product basis. Okay. So uh, on that, and then as we, the reports are out, they're readable, the FDA is reading them, we're reading them, uh, transitioning to what they mean and the future. Uh, We'll start with litigation, then we'll backtrack to what the FDA can do and what Congress can do. Because you mentioned both of those, there there are options there. How does this how does this report or these reports affect ongoing litigation and then vice versa? How might ongoing litigation affect the FDA's willingness and capacity to implement some of the suggestions they're in? Excellent question, Kayla. Um, the answer is yes, right? It impacts both. Um, so in terms of the, the ongoing litigation, um, I can't imagine if I were litigating uh, one of those cases and you said, Hey Jeff, what would be like the best evidence you could have? Two types of evidence. One would be internal documents, and this is just theoretical, internal documents from the FDA's Office of Science, because the FDA is here to implement science while the Congress wrote the the law. Uh, FDA's job is to implement that law using the science. Imagine if the FDA's Office of Science said we ought to authorize these products because they are appropriate for the protection of public health or this product, right? It's always on an individual product basis. Imagine if there were a document from the Office of Science saying this product is appropriate for the protection of public health as as required by the law. And then the FDA issued a marketing denial order for that product. That would be really powerful evidence. The other type of evidence that would be powerful is an independent external report written by former FDA leadership using outside expertise. Uh, Well, on the first front, um, some really good independent reporting by Alex Norcia uh, just in the last week found a, uh, using uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, found documents on a specific case of uh, an e-cigarette brand called Logic, and it's a fascinating case. Their e-cigarette that was tobacco flavored received authorization. The FDA found that that e-cigarette was appropriate for the protection of public health because the benefits to society outweighed the risks of, you know, more, it would help more people quit than it would cause harm by youth initiation. Not many youth were using it. Then there was an application for a similar product, also by Logic, that had one important change. That product can be modified by adding the flavor of menthol to that e-cigarette. So it wasn't a different e-cigarette. It was the same exact hardware and the same exact e-liquid with the addition of menthol to it. So that was the only change. That, of course, required a whole new application. And while the FDA issued authorization for the tobacco flavor, Uh, to help adult smokers quit, it wound up issuing a marketing marketing denial order for the menthol flavor, saying that, well, youth prefer menthol flavors, a lot of youth vape menthol, therefore we're denying it. And in the original reporting that came out through FOIA just last week, the Office of Science at the FDA recommended that that product was appropriate for the protection of public health, Specifically, just to give you context, the FDA has announced its intent to ban combustible menthol cigarettes, and it's going down that regulatory path. And if the FDA is going to take away menthol cigarettes, you would think 
that the FDA would want to give those smokers a place to go with a lower risk menthol e-cigarette for sale to adults only. And that's basically what the Office of Science concluded, is especially as we uh, transition adult menthol smokers away from that product, while it's best for them not to use any nicotine product whatsoever, we recognize that some people will continue, and the FDA has said this, we recognize that some people will either need to or want to continue using nicotine, but we want to help direct them and nudge them in the right direction, then why not authorize a product that it was already authorized with only one change, that is menthol. And the Office of Science recommended it. The FDA, the commissioner's office, eventually said, no, we're not authorizing it because of concern about youth usage. So that FOIA document and this report have got to put the FDA Center for Tobacco Products in a very uncomfortable situation because it's got a pile of litigation for past actions. Its current work is being reviewed on an ongoing basis by a federal court in Maryland after in 2019, I think it was, some public health groups sued the FDA for not taking e-cigarettes off the market quickly enough. So the FDA is being watched by a federal court in Maryland fending off litigation for products that it didn't authorize, and it's still got lots of innovative products before it that it's got to consider, and it's got to keep the game fair. It can't change the rules midway. Now, look, I don't, I'm not predicting that the FDA will throw away all of the marketing denial orders that took place to date because the process was so flawed, as, as this report explained. Uh, but it puts the FDA in a really uncomfortable position going forward because it's got to defend what it did in the past, look at what it's doing now, and also move towards a future where the FDA plans to not only ban menthol combustible cigarettes, but in the first quarter of 2023 is expected to announce a mandatory reduction in nicotine in combustible cigarettes, making the cigarette as we know it today no longer addictive. And you will only be able to sell very low nicotine combustible cigarettes as part of an overall view that is meant to move smokers away from the deadliest product and on to lower products. Well, of course, we know that the danger of smoking is from the products of combustion. These new very low nicotine e-cigarettes that the FDA wants to move us towards still have all those dangerous products of combustion. It just has almost no nicotine, so little nicotine that it would no longer be satisfying or to sustain an addiction with the idea of moving smokers to a lower risk product. But how is the FDA possibly going, possibly going to get there when over the past year, it has banned the very products that adult smokers use to quit smoking, e-cigarettes with some flavors. And at the same time, the only products that have received an authorization are the very products that adult smokers in the marketplace have found were not helpful to help them quit smoking. So the policy, the, the procedures, the regulatory process all kind of come to a head and leave us in this situation that, you know, it's no surprise that the FDA uh, tobacco regulation program is an absolute mess on top of the fact that the director of the Center for Tobacco Products, Mitch Zeller, retired last year in the midst of all this. And in the fall, we learned that the director of the Office of Science at the Center for Tobacco Product left his position, but not only did he leave the FDA, he joined Philip Morris International. He joined uh, the opposition, if you will. Um, and it makes you wonder, why would the top scientist at the FDA leave the FDA and go to tobacco industry? And I would suggest that the reason for that is because if you want to institute tobacco harm reduction to help reduce uh, the 400,000 Americans who die every year because of smoking and move them to lower risk products, it appears, given the, commit, the director's departure and the top scientist's departure, that the FDA may not right now be the place to advance public health because it is so politically motivated and so ideological that in fact, the Reagan Udall report recommended uh, that the Center for Tobacco Products really double down on focusing on the science and recognize that the FDA is, yes, it's a public health organization, but it has authority to implement the statute given to it by Congress. And uh, while the report was very 
uh, polite. It was um, really an effort to be, uh, offer constructive criticism. If you strip away all of that niceness and politeness, this was a damning report about every single aspect of the Center for Tobacco Products work over which the Reagan Udall Foundation was given the scope of work to do. And in fact, while the report, the, the FDA commissioned a report and said, look at all of these areas, but don't review our policy work. In fact, if you look at the recommendations from the uh, report, they actually have many policy recommendations because you can't separate out operations, communications from policy, because when you don't communicate to adult smokers, that these lower risk e-cigarettes are in fact less harmful than combustible cigarettes. You're not doing your job as a public health agency. There is data out there that shows that most American smokers think e-cigarettes are as dangerous or possibly more dangerous than combustible cigarettes. And that's the view out there in this country. It is dead wrong. There's no debate. Uh, these are lower risk products. Yet the FDA has continually refused to communicate that science-based information to the very citizens whose public health is, is supposed to protect, which is adult smokers. And the uh, outside experts pointed to that, and it was in the report that the FDA needs to do a better job of communicating not only to stakeholders, but to the public. Okay, so a couple more questions and we'll wrap it out. You brought it back, it seems... Well, it seems the FDA is in a tough spot given their past litigation, their present situation, and the fact that they keep moving forward as we all move through time. Um, and the these reports provide some paths forward. Uh, whether or not they're able to take it, th there are there are some options as to what the FDA could do. Um, how are those implemented? Does the F can the FDA do it within their current statutory authority? Uh, would they? You mentioned more rulemaking, and then. What role does Congress play um, in making this possible? Uh, so uh, that's that's very true. Um, there are a wide wide range of recommendations. Although while the recommendations are pretty specific, they don't actually outline exactly how do we get there. So while they're specific, they're also general recommendations and gives the FDA some range and how to implement them. Now, first of all, it needs to be said that as critical as this report is, and while we talked earlier, the Reagan Udall Foundation does reports for the FDA all the time, this report was unique. It was about how, is, how, how are these divisions doing generally in these areas? Um, the recommendation, for instance, that there be user fees uh, is something that absolutely the agency can't do. It would need congressional authorization. Uh, now, I think it's a lot easier to go to Congress and ask for a change when you've got an external report saying it. In fact, I think that's part of the reason. Why did the commissioner ask for this review? I think uh, they wanted to be able to go to Congress to recommend changes. And rather than saying, hey, we want more money, uh, say the outside experts say we should have more money. Um, but I think a recommendation like that might be good because it might, as we discussed earlier, uh, kind of integrate the uh, Congress more into the ongoing process as it does on the drug side with PDUFA, where these user fees have to be reauthorized by Congress. Some of the recommendations, such as working with uh, other, uh, to have better enforcement but, and to achieve better enforcement by working with other agencies, um, a lot of that can be achieved uh, through the commissioner's office. And, you know, certainly the uh, recommendation that there be better communication uh, does not take an act of Congress. Um, that's in, uh, you know, there's already a requirement uh, that the FDA use the best science and you would think, uh, therefore, communicate it. Um, but that's nothing new. So the question is, will FDA change? And this report has no teeth in terms of FDA doesn't have to do it. The only way the FDA will begin implementing uh, and perhaps selecting some of the recommendations to begin implementing is if there is, um, is enough pressure on it uh, by the stakeholders, uh, by the courts in various ways through the past litigation and the current litigation, uh, and through the administration. Is the White House going to say, we asked for this report, uh, we better implement what it said? 
Um, and some of it will require congressional authorization. Some of it won't. My question is, will the current leadership at the FDA, and I'm not talking about just Dr. Robert Caleb, the commissioner, uh, who's kind of got a big overview, but will the new director of the Center for Tobacco Products be able to implement these changes? Dr. Brian King uh, was the commissioner or the, the director of the office when the FDA decided not to authorize the Logic e-cigarette. And now we know that he did that against the advice of the Office of Science. And how will the White House feel about the fact that the new director of the Center for Tobacco Products, who comes out of the CDC, overruled the science office in issuing a major uh, marketing denial order? And is that the leadership that the Center for Tobacco Products should have right now in order to begin implementing these very important, uh, highly validated changes that are being recommended? Uh, I would say um, the administration is going to have to think, uh, Dr. Califf is going to have to think about whether uh, there needs to be new leadership at the center to be able to enforce these, re these recommendations. <laughs> Got it. Well, thank you. Uh, barring any other concluding comments, we'll wrap it there. Mr. Steer, we really appreciate uh, you making the time to be with us today and sharing your expertise and insight for our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. If you'd like to find out more content like this, please feel, to check us out. feel free to check us out at rigproject.org. Again, thank you so much and you have a great day. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 